Good morning, City Light Church, and welcome. For those of you who are new with us, I want you to know that we are a place where everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. And we believe in moving people from where they are to where God wants them to be. So thank you so much for joining us online. Uh, we are gathering today online and in person. People are coming in. We are getting pumped up for this message where we are talking about boldness and how we are sent by Jesus to be bold and to share Jesus with the world. And so we're going to be in Acts today. Um, so make sure to turn there in your Bibles, get your Bible out, get a pen and notebook out, something to take notes. And uh, we're excited to talk about boldness. Wherever you're tuning in from, let us know whether you're in the country or somewhere out of the country. Man, that would be so cool uh, to, to hear from all of you to see where everyone's tuning in from. So go ahead and post it in the chat. And uh, we are so excited that you're with us today. So I have a story about boldness, uh, kind, of a, kind of a funny story. Um, I, I, this just goes to show that sometimes when we are bold as Jesus has called us to, it does not go how we think it should go. So I have a buddy of mine that was decided he wanted to be bold and to be obedient to what Jesus has called him to share with others. And so he was in line at a Starbucks one time and uh, he felt like Jesus calling him to share the gospel with this girl and felt like Jesus had, the Holy Spirit had told him that she had uh, an abusive father, a father that had uh, not been very kind to her, never told her she was beautiful. And so he decided to answer that call and say something, and he did. And her response was not what he expected. She said, no, my father was a great father. I had the best father in the entire world. None of that happened. And so, of course, he felt a little silly, um, but he answered what he felt like was God's voice. Um, and sometimes we're going to learn today where God calls us to be bold, but sometimes... It doesn't go how we think it's gonna go and that is completely fine. The Bible calls us to be bold and to test out the Holy Spirit. So you may not be always be on point. You, you may be wrong sometimes and you may have some awkward in, encounters, but today we're going to hopefully be encouraged by this message and hopefully, I, I, my prayer for all of us is that we would be bold uh, even in the midst of awkward situations and in the midst of things not going our way. Um, so. Doesn't sound like there's a lot of hope here, but I, I do want to tell you that sometimes they won't always go how you think they're going to go. So we're excited to jump in this. So get your coffee, get your family, and I dare you to share this message. If you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and share that link on someone's page. Invite your friends. Invite someone right now. I dare you to share. Invite someone to church right now, even online. So let me pray for us, and then we'll get started with this message. So dear Lord... We give you this message today. We give you all of us, Jesus, and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us, to comfort us. Lord, I pray that we feel your love today. I, feel, I pray that we feel your presence. Bless this worship team. Bless the tech team. Bless Josh as he speaks your word today, and may he show more of you and less of him. In Jesus' name. Well, guys, get ready. Get a pen and notebook out, get your Bible, get your coffee, because I believe God is going to speak to you today. Good morning, City Light. How y'all doing? Good? Awesome. Well, welcome. Welcome to church. If this is your first time joining us, hello. We are so excited that you are here with us this morning. Um, we believe here that everyone is welcome, um, nobody is perfect, and anything is possible. Amen? All right. Well, why don't you all go ahead and stand up, and we're going we're gonna to worship this morning. We serve a great God. It's a good day to be alive. Amen? <laughs> You 
is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who
Amen. May faith arise in this room. Heavenly Father, even now, we pray that you would have your way, that our faith would rise, that there would be no cap on what you can do in our lives, that there'd be no cap in what you can do in this place. I pray that we would allow your word to speak freely. I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would inhabit the praises and the prayers of your people. Come and do what only you can do in this hour, Jesus. In your name, we pray, amen. Hey, as you're taking a seat, let's give a hand clap of praise to the Lord. Welcome all of our uh, extended family joining us online this morning. It's going to be a great day. I want to give a shout out. I, I spoke this week to um, Ann, you and Joyce want to say that we love you. We're praying for you. Um, they're walking through some things right now. We're praying for both of them. And we want to say hey to Tamara and Vern. We're glad that you guys are joining us online. Rebecca, who is moving to Gainesville, glad that you're here too. And Peter Shungway and little baby Joshua, we miss you and we love you guys. We're glad that you're here this morning. I believe that God wants to do something special today, and it's so good to see each of you. Um, it's just one of those special things. We get to gather on the Lord's Day as God's people, singing God's praises, and one of the benefits is just seeing each other. Isn't it wonderful just to be around people? <laughs> so last week, we concluded our emotion series, and we, we took a little time to just assess what was going on in our hearts and in our minds, and we allowed Scripture and Christ's example to, to show us how to get a grip in this crazy world. Like we took some time to, to talk about and gave ourselves permission to pause and think about just our emotional well-being. And we looked inwardly and we, we had some common sense about some of the things we feel, anger and, and uh, sadness and anxiety. Uh, because the honest to goodness truth is we are living in a very emotionally charged world. And today, as we're shifting gears, man, I was praying about this. I was like, God, where do we go from here? Uh, that, was, that was a timely word that you gave us. I pray that you would um, continue working at it. And today, I want to shift gears. Instead of asking, how do you feel? How do I feel? We've been asking that. Instead, let's, we want to ask, what is God doing? What is God doing? We've been saying, how am I feeling? Let's ask, what is God doing? Because we're emotional creatures. It's just part of being human. It's the human experience, but we're not defined by our emotions. Jesus experienced emotions, but he wasn't defined by them. And as Christians, we know this. We know that we are defined not by what we feel, but by what God says about us, right? What God says is a higher truth over our lives. And today, more than ever, we need to make decisions that are based not on how I feel, but instead it's based on what God has to say about me. Now, I realized as I was uh, putting this together, the challenge of going from asking the question, how am I feeling, to what is God doing, that there's a challenge, and it's actually a it's, it's tragedy that so much of our lives, even as Christians, when it comes to God, so much of our lives is more about us than it is about him. It's more about how I feel over what God says. So, for example, many of you today, um, maybe you're preoccupied with Hey, God, how can I get you to do what I want you to do? How can I get you to give a thumbs up to what I'm doing in my life? How can I get you to smile on some of my plans instead of trying to figure out what God is up to, what God is doing, and joining him in his thing? See, we kind of flip it around. We're like, God, this is what I want to do. Help a brother out. And uh, God's like, hey, I'm doing a thing. Join me in it. And uh, I think for some of us, it, if we were... To take the time to be honest with ourselves and did a little assessment, we would see that we've really got a self-centered worldview. And, and you can know this by just assessing prayers. Like when I pray, are, are they mostly God bless me? God uh, make me richer. God help me to be happier. Give me what I want. And uh, when things don't go our way, we blame God. You've probably... See, no, you probably know somebody uh, along these lines where they say, man, you know, I tried the God thing. I tried to go to church. I tried praying, and I didn't get a better job, and I didn't get a raise, and I didn't get the date. So God, you know, you didn't do what I wanted you to do. So this whole God thing isn't working out in my life. Do you hear it? Now, what's interesting to me is that so many people actually think that God exists for us when in reality we exist 
to serve him. In fact, Jesus invited people to follow him, and he would push back on this, uh, this mindset, this self-centered mindset. In the New Testament, he's Jesus, loving, gracious, happy Jesus. He would say things like, whoever wants to be my disciple, they've got to understand that their life isn't about them. Whoever wants to be my disciple, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. That's tough. That's tough. Thanks, you know, Jesus, that you're, you're, you're not cutting us any slack. But it remains true today that if we want to be disciples of Jesus, it's less about us and it's more about him. So I want to encourage us as a church, as we are moving further into this new year that's marked by a culture with increasingly, uh, that is increasingly self-centered, it's increasingly uh, self-promoting and self-seeking, I want to help us to move with God. That's what we say around here, right? We want to move with God where it's less about us and it's more about him. I, I pray that you would be praying for me right now uh, to, to help communicate this word effectively and that the Holy Spirit would move among us. As we get, to, as we get started, uh, I pray that this will be a natural step from last week's conversation, these last four weeks. But I want to warn you that it is going to take an inordinate amount of courage. And, and courage is uncomfortable at times, but it's going to take an um, uncomfortable amount of courage uh, nothing short of a Holy Spirit dose of courage is going to take you from where you are to where God wants you to be. Let's just say that from the outset. And where we encounter fear, I pray that this message will incite Holy Spirit courage in your life. Because here's what I believe, here's what I think. All of us, all of us, our eyes are open, right? We see what's going on in the world and we can all agree that it has never been truer than it is now, that we must shine now like heaven on earth. Like this is the time. If there was ever a time to shine, the time is now. This is no time for fear. This is no time for apathy. This is no time for weakness. This is a time for boldness, for action, and for strength. There is a New Testament baton that has been passed on to us that demands of us to be bold for Jesus to be bold in our witness, to be bold in our faith in Christ. It takes zero, it takes zero courage. Check this out. It takes zero courage to live and to pray the way most Christians are living and praying these days. God, just do what I want, right? God, God make me happy, bless me, add some zeros to my checking account balance. It, it requires very little courage to live that way. And, and maybe some of you, your prayers are, could be more courageous. Maybe God could do some things in our lives that would require courage in our prayers, where we undergo a shift of holiness, where we undergo a, a change on the inside, where God's like, hey, I understand that's where you started. We all got to start somewhere, but I'm moving you towards courage in your faith. And maybe your prayers might sound more courageous, like, God, use me to reach more people, even if I'm laughed at even if I'm ridiculed, even if I'm canceled or censored, even if they don't invite me back. That's a courageous prayer. Or maybe a prayer like, God, use me to share the gifts that I have to serve others or to show your love, even if it makes me uncomfortable, even if it costs me or if it demands a sacrifice. Or God, use me. Help me to be a blessing to others, even if I have to change the way I live. Even if I have to rethink my priorities and live a life with open hands, or maybe some of us need to be praying, God, help me every single day to wake up and be faithful to the mundane work. Just the grind behind the ministry for your glory. Now, that, that takes courage. It takes courage to pray prayers that allow God to have his way. See, that's a shift towards holiness. So instead of being self-centered and self-preoccupied, what if as followers of Jesus, we strive to live a selfless life, starting out by denying ourselves and saying, Jesus, we want you, and we want what you want. We want to be bold. That takes boldness. Would you tell somebody next to you, it's time to be bold. It's time to be bold. Hey, if you're online, type it there in the chat. It's time to be bold. 
That's the name. Uh, the name of our series this morning is Called to This. We've been called to this. We've been called to be bold today. And I'm going to give you the context of our scripture before we get there. Um, it's a very common text. We're going to be in Acts chapter 3. But for three years, Jesus had been investing in and teaching and coaching up his disciples, taking them everywhere, right? There's all kinds of stories in scripture of those three years of ministry. And all throughout that time, he had to remind his disciples that now you need to keep in mind that the whole point, the whole reason we're doing this thing is because I am going to die. I came to die for the sins of the world. And then after three days, God is going to raise me from the dead. And the disciples, they didn't like this part of Jesus' teaching. They're like, that's, that's, you know, just keep that to yourself, Jesus. That's nonsense talk. And maybe they didn't want to hear it or maybe they just couldn't get their brains to go there. They didn't understand that part of God's redemption story. But Jesus had to explain it and re-explain it to his, his followers. I came to die for the forgiveness of sins. It's why I came. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the sinner. I have to die. And God is going to raise me from the dead three days later. I'll be back. And, and sure enough. Jesus, after three years of ministry, he goes to the cross, he suffers brutally, he dies for our sins, and then he's placed in the grave for three days. And on Sunday evening, what do you think the disciples were doing? Were, were they out in the streets saying, hey, don't worry about it, he's coming back, right? Like, he told us this was going to happen, and any time now, no, they weren't. In fact... Uh, in, our, in our text today, John, John's gospel, in John chapter 20, verse 19, this is what it says. It says, that Sunday, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Jesus had told them personally, I'm coming back. This is why I came. I came to die, and I'm going to, I'm going to be raised. I'm coming back. But they were cowering in fear behind locked doors. Why? Why were they so afraid? Why were they afraid of the enemies of Christ? And why is it that today, why is it today that we can be afraid and not bold in our witness? And I think that there's lots of reasons why some of us are afraid. I think that some of us, we just don't, when it comes to standing up for Jesus or sharing our faith. I think a lot of times we're afraid because we think we just don't know enough. I have conversations with people all the time. Well, I don't talk about my faith. I don't talk about um, Jesus because I just don't know enough. And if I were to start to try to share my faith, I'm sure somebody would ask me a question and it would be embarrassing. And I, I just, I don't know enough. Or maybe we don't want to offend other people. That's a common one. Right? I, don't, I just don't want to offend. I don't want to be an offense. I don't want to be that type. Of Christian, I, I don't want to be offensive. And uh, in my opinion, if you get down to it, almost every excuse, every excuse that we have really gets down to a root of fear. Like we're afraid. We lack courage. We're afraid that we don't know enough. We're, we're afraid that we'll look silly or we're afraid that we'll be labeled. We're afraid we'll screw it up. Like we're, we're afraid that I'm just not, this isn't what I'm, man, it's not my gift. It's not my, this is what, isn't what I do. And so we hide behind locked doors, afraid of the Jewish leaders. And I completely and totally understand this. I wanted, I wanted to share a story. Um, I remember as a kid, my mom, she would take me and my sisters on visitation several times a month. And some of you are like, what in the world is, is a visitation? And my dad had just become a pastor. And uh, visitation is where you go to a neighborhood and you canvas it and you just go door to door and you knock on the door and your goal is to share the gospel with, with whoever's, whoever's home. And uh, I remember that we would take turns knocking on the door as a kid. I'm, I'm, I'm talking really, really, really little. And uh, if someone opened the door, we had this somewhat quasi memorized script to just kind of get the conversation going, right? And I, I don't recall the whole thing, but I remember like the first part of what we would say it went something like this. Hey, good afternoon. You know, my name is Josh, and these are my three sisters, and, and, you know, this is my mom. And if you were to die today, do you know where you would spend eternity, heaven or hell? <laughs> 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 you know, 
that's a good, I mean, that's one way to start a conversation. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason I remember it so clearly is because my mom would be coaching us as, as we were walking, you know, uh, it was not a neighborhood. We lived in the country, so you had to walk a half mile, you know, to get to the next house. So you had plenty of time to pray and be afraid. And uh, uh, we were walking, and she, we would pray while we were walking, and she would just, you know, just pray that God uses you. Just pray that, that God gives you the words to say. Just pray that you can be an instrument of his grace. And so I can, I can honestly say that I did not pray those things. I, you know what, I was praying, please, Lord, do not let there be anybody at home in this house because it's my turn to knock on the door, right? And uh, just afraid. And I, I think even as adults, that most of us, we would probably say, you know, I'm genuinely, I genuinely believe that people need to hear uh, this kind of thing, but I'm, I'm afraid. And uh, I want to show you this morning just two moments in the lives of our disciples that transformed them from fearful, from fearful people, from fearful people to uh, powerfully um, tremendous momentum um, disciples with a bold witness. And the first instance, if we could just look at verse 19 again, and this is really exciting. So we, we learned that that Sunday evening, verse 19, right? That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors. Locked doors. Because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And then suddenly, the text tells us, suddenly, Jesus, so the man who had died three days before, suddenly, Jesus appears. And Jesus was standing there among them, and, and he says to the disciples, peace be with you. And I, I put myself in those disciples' shoes, and I'm like, what? Yes, I would have amazing boldness if the man who died three days before suddenly appears before me and is like, peace be with you. That would give me boldness. That was one instance that transformed them, gave them boldness. A second instance was a month or two later in the book of Acts chapter 2, we learn that God sends the very presence of his Holy Spirit to his people. And they dwell on his people. I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit dwells on his people. And it gives them, you can look it up and read it for yourself, it gives them great boldness. And suddenly these cowards, they go from being selfish, being timid, being afraid to be, uh, and self-centered, to being bold. And to being courageous and, and preaching in the streets. When we first started City Light, we said this over and over again. We want to be a church that just takes the example that we were given in the New Testament of, of boldness and fervency for what Christ is doing on earth and just do it. Like, like we, we really believe that God is, still in the, in the, um, God is still in the mission. God is still at work in this time, in this place to do what he's always done. And we want to be a part of it. So that's what these guys did. Suddenly they go from selfish to bold. And at one point, they're hiding behind locked doors. And then next thing you know, they're standing on rooftops shouting out this good news of a Jesus who's come to die and be raised again so that you can have new life. And Peter, I love this. Peter, who was the biggest coward of them all? Peter, y'all, he had said to a little girl, I don't know who Jesus is, when she asked him, this little girl, little, you know, fourth, fifth grade or whatever, it's like, weren't you with Jesus? I don't know who Jesus is. So that, that Peter, coward Peter, uh, he is now, after having the Holy Spirit come into his life, he is now out bravely and courageously preaching the Holy Spirit. He's preaching the gospel um, to, the, to the people who are listening. And in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they're on the way to the temple. And they have this Holy Spirit courageous moment and they heal a man and then they go into the temple and they tell everyone about Jesus. Now this infuriates the religious leaders. This is like sticking a broom handle into a hornet's nest. They go crazy. Like they're very angry about what's going on. They want to silence these suddenly brave men. They want to silence them. And so they threaten, we're going to arrest you and we're going, we can kill you. We're going to put you on trial. So the high priest, uh, one, of, one of Christ's enemies, his name was, there's a guy named Anas. And uh, I just want to point out, I want to pause and point out that his mom named him Anas. Like, that, and I have fun with some of those things. I don't know if that's right or not. I don't know if that's very pastoral of me. Um, but his mom named him that. So he, she gets the final say. Uh, 
He's a high priest. And he says to these gutsy disciples, you healed this guy? Like, you healed this guy? In other words, I'm looking at you and I see nothing about you that's impressive. There's nothing about you that makes me think you've got the, the, you can't have done this. And so he asks, by what power or in what name did you do this? And here we see Peter, the guy who was just hiding behind locked doors, the guy who had denied that he even knew Christ. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with courage. And the text says that he said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? No, no, that's not why. Do you want to know how he was healed? Yes, that's exactly what we want to know. Let me clearly state to all of you, and to all the people of Israel, now watch his boldness here, that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. The man you crucified, you crucified him, but whom God raised from the dead. Now this guy is gutsy. He, he, he's saying that because the tomb was empty, because I saw Jesus, because I've experienced his presence and his spirit, I have courage. I'm bold because of the resurrection. And I, I was thinking about us as a church. What can we learn from this example from Peter? And if you're a note taker, write this down. We need to embrace this principle that we speak boldly. We speak boldly about what we believe deeply. It's just true. You speak boldly about what you believe deeply. We all do this. We speak boldly about what we believe deeply. Uh, if you go to a great restaurant and you are just impressed, you tell somebody, right? There's this restaurant over on Ponte Vedra Beach called Lulu's. And I, I love Lulu's. I bought the shirt. I went in there and, and uh, the captain's platter is off the chart. Let me just say, if you're ever over in that neck of the woods, go to Lulu's and get the captain's platter. Now, you, you, you probably need to share it. It's a lot of food, <laughs> but you don't have to. It's really good. I don't usually. Uh, and then there's, if you watch a great Netflix series, if you watch, like my wife and I, before Netflix, I remember we watched 24. And so every night uh, for like, I don't know how many nights, we went out and we would get uh, Chinese food or Japanese food and we'd get some yum yum sauce and we, we'd, put, we'd bring out the bench and we'd sit down and we would just watch uh, 24. And you tell somebody if you like it, right? You're like, man, you gotta watch 24. And I'm not saying that you should. It's an it's old show, it's not that great anymore. It used to be great. Uh, but we speak boldly about what we believe deeply. So, gut check. If we are not speaking boldly about our faith in Christ, do we really believe it deeply? It's, that's a tough question. If we, if we don't really believe it, maybe that's why we're not speaking it. Peter says to his haters, to his accusers, to the people who are powerful enough to cancel him, to, to those people... In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, he says, There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Verse 13 says, The members of the council were amazed. They were, they were shocked. They were blown away. They were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They were, they were amazed when they, they saw the boldness. They could see that these guys were just ordinary men with no special training in Scripture. They also recognized, look at this, they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. So here's a question for us, church. Those of you who are Christians, how amazed are people at your boldness for Christ? How amazed are they? And let's, let's, let's get real practical. Let's try to quantify this as, as best we can. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 is unmoved, completely unmoved. 10 is massively amazed. How amazed are the people around you of your boldness for Christ? And, and if you're writing this down, don't put 10 because you're not Jesus. Jesus was a 10, all right? And uh, don't put 1 because 1 is the devil. And I haven't seen the devil this morning yet. So... Um, what would you say? And uh, for those of you who are probably legitimately a seven or eight, let me help you to know that you are. Um, you probably came to church today 
with somebody. You probably brought one or two or three people and you invited them from school or from work because you're always inviting people either in person or online. And you're like, I just have to bring somebody with me. Or perhaps this week, you, you talked to three or four people about your faith in Christ. Just, just to be a blessing. And God was using you. Or you've got a list of people that you pray for every single day. And you're praying for your mom. And you're praying for your uncle. And you're praying for your brother-in-law, your sorority sisters. And you've got this, this list, this, these names that you're praying for every single day. And you've got a heart to share the good news. You're probably a seven or eight. You know, maybe even a nine. Now, how do you know if, if you're on the lower scale? And that's probably pretty obvious too, right? You never invite anyone to church. Like, mum's the word. You know, are, are you praying? Eh, you know, I, well, I may pray, but I certainly don't pray for other people. You know, are, are you sharing your faith at work? I wouldn't even be sure if the people at work knew if I was a Christian or not. Like, like that, you know... Um, that would probably qualify you down on the lower scale. You're, not, you're down there in the threes and the twos. How amazed would people be by your boldness for Christ? And uh, let me tell you a couple of stories. Years ago, when I was in the Marines over in Iraq, um, everyone on my team, everyone really in my company, they knew I was a Christian. And I would talk to anyone and I would talk to everyone about my faith, and I was hosting these like multi um, branch, like Army, Air Force, Navy, whatever, whoever happened to be on our base, these Bible studies. And so everyone knew where I stood, and the guys would come to me with questions about faith and God and, and you know, spiritual things. And then at one point, I remember um, my team, they thought that Satan was trying to take me out. And uh, every time we would, we would go on a mission, every time that we'd get hit by a roadside bomb, my vehicle, my Humvee, would be the one that got hit just over and over and over again. And so it started to become like, what's going on here? And so I remember one time we were going out on a mission, and I was up in the turret, and I was loading my weapons, and I overheard some of my team members saying, I'm not riding with Wicker. <laughs> <laughs> Satan's trying to take him out. And I had a strong witness. Now, you fast forward to today, and uh, several times a month, I love going to get a tuna sandwich for lunch at a, at a, at a sub shop um, pretty close to here. But there's a guy that I know who works there, and I've known him for some time because he and I used to bring our kids to the same pool. And each time I've seen him, I've, I've felt the little prompting in my Holy Spirit, hey, invite him to church. And I don't, and I haven't. And I keep on squelching that voice in my heart because I don't want things to be weird, right? I, I, like, I, I know this guy, he knows me, we know each other's stories, we, we, we know the way life is. And, and I've squelched that voice in my heart so many times. And so years ago, people were amazed by my boldness. But recently, even I have been amazed by my own spiritual apathy. And I don't say that lightly. Like, I really wonder, why is it that, that I could be so bold for Christ in, in threatening environments, but when things are so easy, it's so easy to be apathetic. What would it be for you? How amazed are people at your boldness for Christ? Or would they be surprised to know? Would they be surprised to know that you were a follower of Christ? So that, rise, that raises a very important question. If you are a Jesus follower, we're called to go into the world. We're called to be salt and light. It's a calling. It's, it's not a suggestion. We're called to this. Called to this. That's our series title. I'm supposed to be about this. So how do we grow? How do we grow in our boldness? How do we become more bold in spirit? And I want to give you two very simple thoughts. Two simple thoughts that we can take with us, carry with us. I pray it's a blessing to you. From Acts chapter 4, they're simple, but they, they can have a profound impact. The first way that we can become bold, number one, is to simply spend more time with Jesus. Spend more time with Jesus. What does that mean? Well, that, that means I'm praying. That means I'm listening to him. That means that me and Jesus are in communication. That means I'm reading his word and I'm allowing him to speak to me. That means I'm spending time at the foot 
of the feet of Jesus. So, for example, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says this. It says, they were amazed by the disciples' boldness, for they could see that they were ordinary men. With, with no special training in Scripture, they hadn't been to seminary. And one verse says that they were, uh, one version says it this way, that they were ordinary and unschooled men. Now, one Greek word that is translated as unschooled is idiotos. Idiotos. Anybody want to guess what English word comes from? Yeah, 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 idiot. Yep. And so if you ever feel like an idiot, if you ever feel like a fool, I hope you'll understand that you're the perfect candidate for God to use in spreading his word. You're the perfect candidate. And these idiots were known for having been with Jesus. Isn't that great? The Bible makes it very clear that these were ordinary men, just like you and me, who had been with Jesus. And we know what happens when followers of Christ don't spend time with Jesus, right? We know what happens there, right? We, well, we quit being heavenly minded. Like instead of being heavenly minded, suddenly we're consumed with everything that's happening in the world around us, suddenly we're easily upset, we're easily worried, we're easily shaken, our, our emotions are, are touch and go, and we get sidetracked, and we, we, we get taken off mission by just all this stuff. It's just stuff, and then one day, there's no spiritual momentum in our life. And we don't have, we don't want to, we have, there's no desire to spend time with God. And all these negative spiritual consequences spin out of our lack of time with Christ. On the other hand, if we're spending time praying, if, if we're walking and talking with Jesus, if we're holding his hand through life, if we're reading his word, if we're letting it renew our minds and adjust our attitudes from selfishness to selflessness, if we pray and we're bringing people before the throne and situations before God, we're listening to God. Listen, watch this. We walk with spiritual confidence. We walk with a sense of divine calling, a, a divine confidence. God is with me. God is guiding me. And suddenly I'm bolder because I've been with him. And when my path crosses your path or someone else's path, I look at it as a divine appointment. Like this is someone that God brought into my life for me to point to Christ. That's, that's my goal. And so I might say something. You know, God loves you. I, I, I might give them something. Maybe, maybe a church invitation card, or maybe I might tip them like a Christian ought to tip. Nothing less than 20%, right? I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give them something. I'm going to do something to serve them. You are an appointment in my life. And it increases my faith. And I become even more bold. And the next day, I want to spend more time with Jesus because I've got spiritual momentum in my life. And if you want to know how to grow in boldness, first, we spend time with Jesus. And the second thing we do, it's really simple, but I'm telling you, if you pray to God about this, he will answer this prayer. And you simply ask God for boldness. You simply ask God for boldness. I wonder when was the last time you asked God for boldness? We ask God for a lot of things. When's the last time you asked him for boldness? If you do, he will answer that prayer. In fact, that's what happens here in the text. The religious leaders, they continue to threaten these men. They continue to threaten the disciples. And in an effort to silence them, they say, we're going to put you in prison. We're going to lock you up. Now imagine for you and I, if not only could you go to jail for sharing your faith, but imagine if you could lose your life for sharing your faith. Now, that, that is the reality for many, many, many Christians around the world today, and it was the reality for these Christians in our text this morning. But what if that were happening to us? Like, you would literally be scared to death behind locked doors, and we'd be praying things like, God, keep me safe. God, like, uh, you, I promise that if you'll keep me safe, if you'll keep my family safe, if you'll keep, then, I'll, and we'll make deals with God, right? But watch how these disciples, under the potential threat of death, watch how they pray. Acts chapter 4, verse 29, they prayed. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness. 
in preaching your word. Not keep us safe. Not protect us today. But give us boldness. The threats are real, Lord. They're real. But but make us even more bold. See, when we spend time with Jesus, we grow in boldness. And when we ask God for boldness, he strengthens our faith. And we start to realign and we start to realize and remember why Jesus came in the first place. Because when this life is over, people will spend eternity somewhere. They will either live in the presence of God in heaven or in horror in eternal damnation in hell. And I'll be honest, I've never been a big fan of the hellfire and brimstone preaching. You know, where you try to scare people out of hell into heaven. Or you, I've heard it said you try to scare the hell out of them, right? Uh, I've never been a big fan of that. Like, like you're, you're going to go to hell where the worm never dies and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I've never liked that, but I cannot be true to Scripture without telling you that there is a very real place that the Bible calls hell. It's called eternal damnation. It's called a place of torment. It's called outer darkness. It's called a place of sorrow. There is incredible suffering that happens day and night eternally in this place called hell. And words cannot convey the horror, the excruciating pain, and the anguish of hell. In the same way, there's another place. And words cannot adequately convey the glory and the beauty and the splendor and the majesty of this dwelling place of God with his, with his people in what the Bible calls heaven. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible tells us that no eye has seen and no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So you and I, we can't even dream it up. We can't even imagine how otherworldly, how absolutely glorious heaven will be. And John, one of the guys in our text this morning, one of these brave guys um, who was preaching there in the temple, he had a vision. And he describes heaven in Revelation chapter 21. And he said this, he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared Verse 3, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. And God himself, what will he do? He will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. We speak boldly about what we believe deeply. See, a timid, fearful faith doesn't break through. It doesn't reach a lost and hurting and broken world. And what I want you to understand is that there are people in your life that you love who do not know the grace of Jesus. And at this moment, it is not too late for them. In this moment, It's not too late, but one day, one day it will be too late. And so what do we tend to think as we're hiding behind the doors? Well, if I well, if I don't get it right, what what if I don't get it right? You know, what if I say the wrong thing? Or or what if I share my faith and they don't want to hear it or I screw it up? What if? What if? What if and there's all this fear. All this fear. Well, but another question that we could ask ourselves, Christians, perhaps a much more powerful question, is what if I don't? What if I don't speak up? What if I don't invite them? Remember this. In one moment, the disciples, they were scared to death, but when they realized 
that Jesus had risen, when they realized that God was with them, everything changed. And for some of you, this is that moment. You were called to this. Let's pray together, church. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would make those who are followers of your son, Jesus, that you would make us bold rather than selfish. God, I pray that we would deny ourselves and that we would follow the one who set the example and sacrificed your life. Those of you who say, I'm a follower of Jesus, my prayer, God, is that you would make me even more bold in spirit. If that's your prayer, I want to be bold. Would you raise your hands boldly? That's my prayer. I need boldness, Jesus. Don't be scared. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you know every heart and you know every, you see every hand. And I thank you so much for people who today are saying yes. God, I pray that we would have a revelation of your goodness through the resurrection of your son, Jesus. May we center our day around you, seeking you above all else. Increase our boldness. We ask for it. God, give us a heart for those who are far from you. I pray that every single day of this week, God, that you give us spiritual eyes to see those who are in need of your matchless love and grace in your son, Jesus. And God, prompt us. Give us courage just to take that one step of faith, not afraid of what will happen if we do, but God, instead, realizing that there might be something worse that happens if we don't. God, make us bold for your son, Jesus. Make us bold. As we keep praying today, nobody looking around, let's go back to earlier in the message and remember what Jesus did before his death. He told them, I'm gonna have to die. Well, why, Jesus? I'm gonna have to die and I'm gonna be raised again from the dead for the forgiveness of sins. If I could just be blunt with you, we live in a culture today where people say, you know, I'm not a bad person. I, I'm not bad. We're all bad people. Have you ever lied or, or stolen or cheated or lusted? Have you ever been greedy? Have you ever been unforgiving? We're all bad people, and the Bible calls that sin. Why do we feel guilty for these things? I believe that God has, has put in us a conscience that helps us to know when we've done wrong against God. And so a lot of times when we think about God, we wonder, could I be good enough for God? Do I need to clean up my act to get to God? And this is the whole point of the good news. Because God so loved the world that he became one of us in the person of Jesus. Jesus was born without sin. He lived the perfect life. He became sin for us on the cross. He died in our place for the forgiveness of our sins. He was raised by God from the dead so that anyone and this includes you. Anyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be forgiven, transformed forever. And if you recognize your need for Christ and that it's time for you to say it, I need Jesus. Listen, when you call on him, he hears your prayers. He forgives your sins and he makes you brand new. Not a better version of yourself, but completely brand new. If you say, that's why I'm here today, Josh. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I repent, I turn from my sins, I turn towards Jesus, I give him my life now. If that's your hand, would you lift your hand? If that's your prayer, would you lift your hand boldly right now? That's my prayer, that I would give my life to Christ. And let's pray now, all together, no one prays alone. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Jesus, save me, change me, transform me, make me new. I believe that you died for me so that I could live for you. Thank you for the life that I have in you. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand to our feet, church.
Thank you. That was great. How everybody doing? Everybody got a meal for the soul right now? Glad to hear that. Um, I have a couple of announcements. The men's basketball, we're going to be trying on this Wednesday coming up from 7 to 9. And then the next Sunday, we have the Visions and Values class. And that's going to be right after the service. Um, make sure if you haven't signed yet for a city group, uh, talk to one of our leaders. We'd be happy to have you around. It's a great place so you can meet everybody and make friends, new friends, and um, great for the spirit, for, for growth. And uh, just remember, you were, shine, you were made to shine, so go and shine like heaven on earth. Have a great day. What's up, City Light? Man, that message was powerful. I don't know about you all. Um, I personally feel convicted to raise my boldness in Jesus' name. So I, I, I pray that we can all do that. Um, I pray that you felt healthy conviction, and I pray that um, we all felt challenged by this message to be more bold. Uh, maybe we're already at a 7 or 8, but I pray that we can raise that to maybe a 9. Uh, maybe not a 10, because I know that's where Jesus is. Um, but right now, think about practical ways that you can, that you and I can raise our boldness number. So even in the chat right now, go ahead and, and put a number from one to 10. Don't be ashamed right now. Right now, I, I feel like I go through seasons where I'm higher and where I'm lower. Uh, right now, I feel like maybe sometimes I feel like even a, a six, uh, which might sound pretty low. Sometimes I feel like a three or four. The, go ahead and put that number in the chat and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna challenge you all and challenge us, challenge myself, to raise that number, even by one number. Um, we can call it our evangelism temperature. Uh, if you think about de degrees in terms of a thermometer, are you cold or are you hot with that stuff? So I pray that we can raise that in Jesus' name. And some of the practical ways that I feel like we can show our boldness, you know, we, we look at boldness, uh, a lot of what the definition of boldness is, is taking risks, being willing to take risks, um, and challenging yourself, having courage. And uh, so let's, let's think of some practical ways we can do that. Maybe one of them is, as Rolando just mentioned, we have a men's basketball night. So if you're a guy, and you like basketball, or you just like the fellowship, or you just like to fellowship with other guys, um, other believers in Christ, make sure to show up this Wednesday from seven to nine and bring a friend. Um, raise that boldness level by bringing a friend to basketball this Wednesday night. It's gonna be great. Um, and in, if you have not shared this post, this Facebook video, this, this sermon, go ahead and share it right now. Don't wait. I know things get busy throughout the week, so do not wait. Go ahead and share that sermon right now with, with even one friend or share it with every single Facebook friend you have. I dare you to be bold. Maybe for you, boldness looks like getting involved in a city group, taking a risk, getting surrounded by people that um, can encourage you to be vulnerable about what you're going through. Maybe um, you, you could be more generous, maybe start tithing, um, whatever that looks like for you. Maybe that looks like just sharing your faith at work. Whatever that looks like for you, pray about it and ask God how you can challenge yourself to be more bold. So go ahead and put that in the chat, your scale of one to 10, where you think you are in your boldness, and what do you think it will take to grow in boldness? And I'll mention that next week. I, I really pray that we can uh, rest on that this week and challenge ourselves on that this week. And think about who is one person you will share your faith with this week, even just one person. Uh, even if you have to start off small, Share your faith with one person, and I dare you to bring someone to church, whether online or in person, I dare you to do that. So I'm excited to see us as a church body that is growing in boldness, in Jesus' name. So let me pray for us, and then we will get going. I pray that, and I, I do hope that you're maybe grabbing lunch with someone. Uh, I know we're all, uh, people are heading out, people are grabbing lunch together and fellowshipping with one another today and encouraging one another. So I pray that you're doing the same. So Jesus, 
We lift you up today. We pray that you speak to us today and the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, we pray that we all hear your voice. And Lord, we pray that you raise our boldness levels in Jesus' name, that we would not be afraid to share our faith, that we would just boldly go out and do exactly what you have called us to do. So in Jesus' name, amen. We hope that we see you next week. We, we hope that we either see you online or in person. And I pray that you have a great rest of your week. And remember, you were made to shine. So go shine like heaven on earth. See you next week.